Welcome inside a very special edition of Big Ten Today. Rick Pizzo joined by Trent Meacham. I love this day because it's the day we get to look back and recognize all the great performers and performances from this past regular season. And very well deserved, Rick. We got real star power in this league. Some legends actually in the game. So it's, it's great to reward these players, these individuals, and coaches. This is going to be fun. So without further ado, let's get to it. Our big story revealing the all Big Ten first team and no surprise headlined by Zach Eady. Rick, Zach Eady might be the most dominant player in Big Ten history. Gets it done night after night at such a high level. Has elevated his game once again. Congrats to Zach Eady. Averaging about 24 and 12. The only other unanimous first team selection, Northwestern's Boo Booey. This guy's a legend for Northwestern. They will build a statue for him. Incredible what he's done year in, year out, and once again. Yeah, Ray Phil still trying to raise money for that <laughs> statue fund. Taryn Shannon's junior missed some time, but didn't miss the first team. Hey, still almost 22 points a game. So explosive in the open court. He's a nightmare to contain in transition. We know what Zach Eady thinks of Braden Smith. Now we know he's a first teamer. The ultimate floor general. Great feel for the game. No one understands when to get his and when to get his teammates going better than Braden Smith. Now the coaches voted Marcus Domask on the first team. Well, in conference play, he really elevated his game, almost 19 points a game. A straight bucket is so effective from 15 feet and in. Taking over for Jalen Pickett as the reigning king of booty ball. And on the media <laughs> side, the fifth spot goes to Maryland's Jameer Young. Over 20, 20 points a game. Such an explosive point guard can completely take over games on the offensive end. And so as we give you one complete look at the all Big Ten first team, again, a six player team, Edie and Bowie, the unanimous selections, Shannon Jr., Smith, selected by both the coaches and media, Jameer Young, a media pick while the coaches opt for Marcus Domask. Among all those greats, one player stands above, and fittingly, it is Purdue's big guy, Zach Eady, becoming just the fourth Big Ten player ever to win Player of the Year in consecutive seasons, joining Jim Jackson, Matzine Cleves, and Luca Garza. Eady, also a favorite to join an even more exclusive list and become a two-time National Player of the Year. It is time for today's big interview, and it is with the Co Player of the Year, Zach Eady. Zach, first and foremost, congratulations on winning this honor for a second straight year. And I want to start with that because it's not just your second straight player of the year, but the second straight in which you've done it while winning the outright regular season championship, which I know is so important to Coach Paint. How much more special does it make this award? Yeah, um, I mean, winning the regular season is one of the most impressive things you can do um, just in college basketball. It doesn't matter what conference it is. Um, it's tough. It's a long season. Um, I'm proud of my guys for kind of locking in during this stretch, um, kind of responding the way we did. And uh, I keep uh, focusing on, like, the important things, like focusing on like getting, like, a lot of guys have been through it, but getting, like, Lance the championship, getting getting Miles the championship. I think it's kind of the guys who really did it for this year, um, and we were able to do that for them. Now, Zach, everybody on the outside knows the points. They know the stats. They know the numbers. They see the awards what don't they see about what you've put in from a work perspective and a development perspective to get where you are now? Yeah, um, I think people kind of see me like improving really a lot from my sophomore and junior year and then, then obviously my junior year this year. Um, but they don't see kind of the work that I put in my before my freshman year, during between my freshman and sophomore year, like like all the work that leading up to that that allowed me to um, kind of take that explosion I had last year and then continue that this year. Uh, I think people just kind of they don't, they don't see that. So what for you was the most difficult part of that development? There's so many different aspects that go into it. Conditioning, diet, the weight workouts, the footwork. What for you was the hardest to perfect? Um, probably I would say uh, like it's just, just kind of staying consistent with it. I think that's the biggest thing. Um, I think I had some up and downs, like obviously kind of when, when you have success, sometimes you want to go away from the work. And that, that I think I had, I had stretches in my freshman year when I did that, but I learned from it. I, I, I understood that like when you, when you go away from your work, sometimes you won't perform in the games. So I, I learned from it. I kept growing and I kept staying consistent with it and every day in the gym, every day after practice, getting my shots up, getting my routine in, uh, making sure I'm getting in the sauna, make sure I'm getting in the ice tub, make sure my body's feeling right. Um, just staying consistent with that, I think is the biggest thing. I also think it's interesting, you cannot control the officiating. And a lot of officials have never officiated a guy who plays like you 
at your size. They officiate differently. How do you handle that and not get frustrated sometimes when you're getting calls that on other nights you are getting? Yeah, um, it just kind of comes with understanding how hard it is to referee me. Um, I understand that the refs aren't trying to miss a call. They're not trying to uh, intentionally like let dudes foul me. Um, they're trying their best to make every call. Uh, sometimes I'll make them, sometimes I'll miss them, but it's just like us. Like sometimes I'll make a shot, sometimes I'll miss a shot. Um, the ref's not gonna get mad at me for missing a shot. <laughs> uh, obviously I'm, in the game, I'm gonna like feel some, like a little, have a little feelings towards a, a referee for like, like missing a call. Like, I might get upset, but I know at the end of the day, they're really trying their hardest to make every call. And uh, I have a good relationship with a lot of the referees and uh, relationships that I really value. Zach, I love the fact that you put out that post last week. If you're not voting for Braden Smith to be a first-team All-American, I don't want to be on the ballot as well. Why did you put that out? I just believe people kind of overlook him a lot. Uh, I think he really makes our team go. I think uh, there's a lot of times that, where he's like the first option on offense, like setting him a ball screen, getting him in action, uh, and making him make the read. Um, I think I think a lot of the stuff that he does, people don't look at it because I, I – I put up a lot of like big numbers, but he he makes everything work. He finds the open man. He'll, he'll make the right pass all the time. Like he, we don't have to worry about him turning the ball over in a press. Like I think he does a lot of things that uh, people don't really recognize, and I, I think he he should be rewarded for it. All right, Zach, let's go off the beaten path. Let's have a little fun because I know you answer so many media questions, and you have to answer the same question a lot over and over again. So. I want to go to the Great White North. You're obviously Canadian. I grew up in northern Vermont, so we were actually closer to Canada than I was to any other state. I want to ask you some questions about Canada, kind of quick rapid-fire answers here, and then just explain why you answered the way you did, okay? So, so here we go. Better Canadian snack food, ketchup chips or poutine? Ketchup chips, but I'll dress the best. All right. I like a good ketchup chip myself. I know you played hockey growing up outside of Toronto. Are you an old school Maple Leaf guy, Matt Sundin, or a new school Maple Leaf guy, Austin Matthews? Uh, probably new school. I didn't really ever get to watch the, the old school. So I'm, I'm, I'm believing in this team right now. Yeah, see, that's, that's a nice way of Zach calling me old for even knowing the guys that played way back then. Uh, anybody who did play Canada, play hockey, especially if you did it near the border, you heard two national anthems before games. So, better national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner or O Canada? I, I mean, obviously O Canada, but uh, might be a little bit biased in that answer. That's a fair answer. Uh, you're going to be patriotic no matter what you say. You go with O Canada, you've been listening to the Star Spangled Banner for a long time. Really can't miss. Best Canadian musical artist or band of all time. And I want to warn you, if you say Nickelback, we may have to end the interview right now. Canadian artist? Musical, musical artist. It's just got to be Drake. Drake is the correct answer. There really is no other answer. Uh, nickname you prefer that has a little bit of a Canadian tie? The Big Maple, the Canadian Condor, or none of the above? Uh, the, the Big Maple is solid. People... People pretty really like that. Um, it's the name they chose for me. And I, I'm, I'm glad to take it. All right. And, and finally, I want to know about the geographic excellence of your teammates. Ten provinces in Canada. I won't even ask about the three territories. How many of your teammates, this includes coaches, could actually name all ten Canadian provinces? Probably some of the coaches because they, they do a little recruiting in Canada, but I don't think any of my teammates could. Yeah, and if I threw in the provinces there, the territories, I should say, there's no chance anybody gets all 13. Uh, Zach, you do get all the points, all the rebounds, and the Big Ten Player of the Year for the second consecutive year. We appreciate the time. Look forward to watching you play this weekend up in Minneapolis. Thank you. The Big Ten Coach of the Year is a shared award for the first time in nearly a decade. Matt Painter wins the honor for the fifth time in his Purdue career, tying Bob Knight for the second most all-time after leading the Boilers to a second straight outright regular season title. Painter sharing the award with Nebraska's Fred Hoiberg, who takes home his first Big Ten Coach of the Year honor. Nebraska's third place regular season finish is the Huskers' best since joining the Big Ten and the best in any conference in more than three decades. Time for us to take you to Lincoln, where we meet with the Big Ten Co-Coach of the Year, Fred Hoiberg. Fred, first and foremost, congratulations. I want to know how it sounds to your ears to hear Fred Hoiberg, 2024 Big Ten Coach of the Year. 
Well, I, I appreciate that, Rick. It, you know, anytime you, um, you know, you get one of these awards, it, it's really a testament to the entire program. And, you know, I'm, I'm very blessed to have a great staff that comes in here, everybody on the same page, uh, the work ethic that these guys display on a daily basis. The assistant coaches obviously are the ones on the bench, but there's a lot of behind the scenes work that goes on with your video coordinator, with, uh, you know, your player development, with the guys that are down there on the floor. Uh, working with your players, getting a lot of extra time in. Uh, so I'm really happy for everybody in the program, uh, just where things are with Nebraska basketball right now. I think we're playing as well uh, as anybody, certainly playing our best basketball of the year. And, uh, you know, big week ahead. Just love this time of year with the uh, starting with the Big Ten tournament this week and then hopefully uh, hearing our name called on Selection Sunday. Fred, from the outside, whether that be fans or media, coaches are so often judged almost entirely on wins and losses. From a coach's perspective, when do you know that you and your staff are doing a good job? Well, I think it's it's uh, it's all about are, are you are you making the necessary steps? Are you are you staying on the task at hand? Are you staying with uh, the the mission through the tough times and through adversity? And you know, when I look at this group that was put together, you know, really from day one, uh, when our guys met on campus, we were very fortunate to have a foreign trip this year. We went to Spain, and when we started that preparation, I could tell that this was a group that had a chance. Uh, to do something special just based on their work ethic, based on their approach. And, you know, it starts every day in the weight room and in, in the off season. That's the most important part. And, you know, all the other things that our guys have bought into with nutrition, uh, with sleeping habits, with taking care of their bodies. And we've got a very mature team. We have the oldest team in the Big Ten. And, we, you know, when the coaches are putting the plan together, uh, you know, as far as how to try to take advantage of certain skill sets, uh, with our roster. And we have some pretty unique players. Uh, and then also, what can you do defensively? And that's where I've, I've been really proud of this group is how we have taken, uh, you know, enormous steps on that side of the ball. You know, defensively in January, we struggled, but we were as good as anybody. I think second in the nation in defensive efficiency in the month of February. And, you know, I give our staff a lot of credit for that. Nate Lenzer is a guy that I really, uh, you know, kind of put the defense on him. And we tried to come up with a system uh, that fit our personnel on that side of the floor. And, yeah, you know, we've been really good on that end. Michigan, first half, we weren't great, but second half, we held them to 24%. And uh, that's what allowed us to pull away, uh, you know, in a very important game for us in the last game of the season. So, you know, when we put this group together, I could tell it was a very mature group that came in uh, with the right approach every day. And I think that's why we're sitting where we are right now. Fred, more proof that the media has no idea what it's talking about. You were 12th in the unofficial preseason poll. You mentioned the European trip and the experience, but was there a point during the season where you realized that this team had the ability to be something special at the end of the year? Well, you know, we, 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 I'm really uh, happy with how we rebuilt this roster, and we lost some great pieces that I thought did a great job in really helping build the right culture uh, in this program with Sam Griesel, with Emmanuel Bandemel, uh, with Derek Walker, and, you know, we had some, you know, not only on the court things that we had to replace, but really leadership is where we uh, needed the biggest, um, uh, you know, to, to fill the shoes of those guys that did such a great job for our team every day. And that's where getting guys like Josiah Alec and Rink Mast and Bryce Williams and Jerron Coleman uh, in the transfer portal really helped in that area. And, you know, those guys have been absolutely phenomenal. Uh, the other thing, you know, when you have a group that you can coach, and when you can sit in a film room and nothing is taken personal and they can take constructive criticism, then you have a chance. And that's exactly what these guys have done. And a lot of that is due to the senior uh, leadership and the veteran leadership that we have uh, in this program. And, you know, that's what you have to have in this league. And, you know, I think this really is a group that our fan base can be proud of. Uh, just with how hard they play. You know, we're on the floor a lot. We talk a lot about that, being first to floor, 50-50 balls, uh, going out and battling and defending every night. So, you know, those are the things that I've been really impressed with this team. But, you know, I'm so thankful last year's group, and we had a couple injuries. When you lose Bandamel and Juwan Gary in January and have to replace, you know, two of the guys that really created a defensive identity for this program last year. And, uh, you know, we replace them with players that have that similar mindset and that same hardworking mentality. And, you know, when you have a hardworking team that competes uh, every possession, again, you're, you're going to have a chance most nights you step on the floor.
Fred, how much fun, and I know coaches will a lot of times say the grind during the regular season is rarely fun, even when you win, but when you have a team that plays with the infectious joy of a Keisei Tominaga, the role definition that you talked about with especially guys like Josiah Alec, and what seemed to just be an overall team connectedness, how enjoyable is that to see from a coaching staff perspective? Well, this to me is going to go down as one of my all-time favorite teams that I've ever coached. Whatever the result is the rest of the way, it just really has been a team. You don't have to worry about anything. There's no ego. There's no agendas with the players. And, you know, it's it's really, again, I, I, I give the guys all the credit in the world uh, for their overall daily approach, uh, you know, to what everything that we're trying to teach. And when, you know, when you have a group that comes in here and it's all about the team, it, uh, it really does make our job so much more enjoyable. Uh, you know, we've had very few instances, I think one time all year where one of our freshmen slept through an alarm. That's really the only time I can remember that we had anybody late for a practice. And hell, that happened to me, Rick. When I was a freshman at Iowa <laughs> State, I slept through my alarm on our first morning practice. So, you know, it just, it, you don't have to worry about any, uh, you know, any distractions uh, you know, these guys have taken care of themselves, taken care of their bodies. And, you know, that that certainly makes our job a lot more fun. Fred, you mentioned that road win at Michigan to end the year, picked up a couple of road wins late. The bad news is, as good as the year was, you don't get to take Pinnacle Bank Arena with you to Minneapolis. It was such a great home court advantage for you guys. But how important was it for you to have a little bit of success, bit of success on the road as you get ready for the postseason? Well, it, it was so important. We had a great win early uh, over Kansas State in, in a very tough environment. I know that from my playing days in the old Big 8 and coaching uh, in the Big 12 for five years. That's one of the great venues in college basketball. So that was a, a huge win for us early uh, in the non-conference schedule. And then to, to get a, a big win, um, you know, obviously we'd had our struggles and get the big win against Indiana. Uh, you know, we had a 20-point lead in halftime in that game, they made a huge run on us, cut it to three with about 10 minutes left. And one guy I give a lot of credit to is Jerron Coleman, who came in here. It's his last year of college basketball, uh, you know, not on the floor as much as he would like. But he showed unbelievable leadership and pulled the group aside uh, at the under 12 media timeout, really kind of calmed everybody down. And then we pulled away and ended up getting a good double digit win. And then to get that last one of the year, um, you know, it was important for us to get that that locked up the double by. Uh, for us going into uh, the Big Ten tournament, and it, it's huge. I mean, anytime you can get a road win like that, um, you know, it just really helps with the resume come Selection Sunday. All right, Fred, well, let's finish with that as you guys get set to head to Minneapolis. It's a place that's very special to you. A lot of connections there. What's this week going to be like for you with the focus, obviously, on winning three games in Minneapolis, but also taking your team back to a place that's such a big part of your life? Yeah, it, it really is a <clears throat> excuse me. It really is a special place for me, Rick. I, I spent seven years of my life there. Uh, my final two years of my playing career were in Minnesota. We made a great run in the Western Conference Finals that year. Sam Cassell wouldn't have tore a muscle in his hip in the uh, in the uh, semifinals against uh, against uh, Sacramento. I think we would have won a World Championship that year. So just have really special memories. I, I had my open heart surgery there that really essentially saved my life. Uh, at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, and then had five great years working with uh, Kevin McHale, and you know, really uh, learning a lot about the game. Uh, you know, when I when I hung up my playing shoes, so it really is a special place, uh, great sports town, and you know, really looking forward to getting back there. We still have a lake home up in the uh, northern Minnesota area, and uh, just really is a special place. You know, but it is. It's all about going out there and trying to finish off uh, this portion of the season well before you go into uh, into March Madness. So just really looking forward to it. I think our team is in good shape. Uh, you know, knock on wood, we've got good health uh, right now with our guys and, uh, and hopefully play well uh, this week. I know you and I have some mutual friends up in the Twin Cities. I know they're excited to see you this week as we are as well. Fred Hoiberg, 2024 Big Ten Co-Coach of the Year. Again, Fred, congrats. Look forward to seeing you this weekend in Mini. All right, Rick. Thank you. I appreciate it. Rick Pizzo back now with Trent Meacham. So the first time since 2015, we have co-coach of the year winners and two guys who coached very different teams. Matt Painter knew the expectations 
and met them, there's no question that Fred Hoiberg and the Huskers exceeded everyone's preseason thoughts. I think both very well deserved, starting with, with Coach Hoiberg. You know, the first three years were really a struggle for the Cornhuskers, getting them going. 9-11 and in conference last year, now 12-8. and I just have loved how, he's, how he does it from the sidelines. So composed. You, the team plays with that composure. It's a beautiful style basketball, but they combine that with the grittiness. That's how he was the mayor as a player. And he understands the flow of the game, Rick. I, I look back to that come from behind victory over Wisconsin. C.J. Wilcher led them to that victory in the second half. Tominaga didn't play much. The very next game in Champaign against Illinois, Tominaga went for 30, and so he understands the rotations, what buttons to push, as well as any coach in our conference. And I'm glad Matt Painter gets the recognition because often this award is not given to a coach whose team is expected to win. Purdue is expected to win, but Matt Painter takes home coach of the year for the fifth time in his career. I tell you, what, when you have those high expectations, it's hard to deliver on them. They did it last year. They've been the class of the Big Ten in recent seasons, so well-deserved for Matt Painter. I love that he recruits his guys. He trusts his eyes. He doesn't care what guys are ranks, ranked. He develops his players. He's built that the culture of Purdue basketball right now is probably as good as it gets in the Big Ten, so very well deserved for Matt Painter. I got a feeling they're cooking up something special here in March, and they're going to be ready to go th this month. Yeah, there's a lot of people that believe that, that believe that this Purdue team is destined to erase all of those disappointments of March's prior. They had two guys on the All-Big Ten first team, and Zach Eady and Braden Smith, as we now take a look at the first reveal of the All-Big Ten second team. And you see more than five players because, again, remember, there are two different lists, coaches and media vote. Anytime there are enough votes for players from either organization, you get placed on that team. So your All-Big Ten second team includes Tyson Walker and A.J. Storr, who were chosen by both the coaches and the media. Jameer Young, who is a first-team media selection, is a second-team coaches pick. Kase Tominaga, Tony Perkins also picked by the coaches. Marcus Domask was a first-team coaches pick. He's second team by the media, as are Khalil Ware and Dawson Garcia. Sometimes we look at these selections from an individual perspective. Sometimes we look from a collective and the group of guys that are chosen. When you look at the first and second team, the first team specifically, what kind of jumps out in terms of what was rewarded and honored with those picks. Winners were rewarded. You got two from Purdue and you got two from Illinois, and then you have Boo Booey, the winningest player in Northwestern his history. So I think that's how it should be. And look, all these individual guys have put up big numbers, and we've seen them all, Rick, completely take over games, control games, whether that's Zach Eady at seven foot four or Braden Smith at six feet, feet tall. All these guys have done that in their own unique way. And I think it was pretty clear. I asked my, my twin seven-year-olds this morning, who's first team all Big Ten? They nailed the five of the coaches. That's pretty right, impressive. Right away. So I think it was very clear. Even a guy like Jameer Young, Maryland didn't quite have the success, but he's a winner in how he plays. I saw him control the game in Champaign. Big win over the Illini on the road. So I, I think they got this right. Well-deserved from those first team. And then the second team, those guys can play too. Now, did, did each of the twins get all five, or did they put their brains together and combined well, – get all the picks it was a, it was a quick huddle but man they were they were pretty quick with those with those five damask shannon Bowie, Edie, and smith yeah future players maybe future broadcasters in the meacham household as well after tuesday's announcement we know that only one man in big 10 history has more coach of the year awards than our next guest matt painter winning his fifth this year tying bob knight gene Cady still stands at the top of that list with seven coach of the year awards of course, he is the mentor of Matt Painter. And Matt, I know you've won this award, obviously, multiple times. This one does tie you with Coach Knight, Gene Cady, two more ahead of you. What is it like to be on that list? You were a part of this list, but now to tie Bobby and look only up at the guy that taught you a lot of what you know. Yeah, it's, it's pretty special. Obviously, growing up in the state of Indiana and really just watching that rivalry, watching Coach Knight and Coach Cady and you really didn't think anything else in terms of like who was going to coach at those institutions afterwards. You just always thought they would be the coach. And uh, everybody looked up to those two guys. And uh, that's what it was about. It kind of, you know, it's surreal to be in, in this position, but, you know, Purdue's a, a great basketball um, environment. Um, obviously, we have a lot of players and great coaches in the state of Indiana and the surrounding states. Um, it, it's just a special place, you know, great education, great people. So feel very fortunate, you know, to be the coach at Purdue. 
Uh, Matt, I mentioned this is your fifth. I think one of the previous four was shared with Thad Mata from Ohio State. This one you share with Fred Hoiberg at Nebraska. What are your thoughts on the job that Fred did this year? Well, I think, you know, you, in these situations, like if you keep things in perspective, like Tom Izzo's won the Big Ten ten times, been to eight Final Fours, but has only been coach of the year like three or four times. And so you got to keep things in perspective. It's a much harder to get the award like when you're picked to win the league, like that's difficult. And so when you set the standard that Tom Izzo has, it's like close to impossible sometimes to, you know, to actually get the award. So we were picked to win it this year. It makes no sense because last year we weren't, um, you know, picked to win it. But, you know, in Fred's position, you know, getting a lot of new guys and growing them and, you know, getting guys to return that they got out of the transfer portal and then mixing in, you know, some younger guys and some freshmen and growing those guys. So, you know, he's done a fabulous job. Like, you know, the, their system defensively is very good. Their system offensively is very good. And if you can be different in this game, you know, we're all copycats and we all follow and steal from each other. But if you can be a little bit different, it really helps you. And I think they're, they, they have a different scout offensively and defensively. You know, Tom and I, is such a tough cover for us. Rink Mast is a tough cover. And then you throw in guys like Bryce Williams. I could go on and on about their team, but, you know, very, very deserving. You know, Fred's very, very deserving of this award. And, he, and he's done fabulous and, and really happy for him getting the double bye and getting ready for the NCAA tournament. Matt, one of your former players, one of my colleagues here at the Big Ten Network, Rafael Davis, tells me all the time about the emphasis that you and your staff put on the Big Ten regular season. So what does it mean right. to you and the program to win the regular season title outright in back-to-back -back years? Yeah, it's huge. You know, I, you know, Coach Weber, Coach Katie, you know, the guys, that my mentors, those guys, it was such a big deal um, to win the Big Ten, just to try to compete with Indiana and try to compete with everybody else to put yourself in that position. So to be able to win it back to back and especially by multiple games, we won the league by three games back to back years. First time since Indiana's, you know, great run, you know, the last undefeated team in college basketball in 1976. When you, you know, kind of say those words, that's also surreal. Um, but, the, you know, it should go out to our players, you know, all the accolades, you know, Zach Eady, Braden Smith, Fletcher Lawyer, Mason Gillis, Trey Kaufman ran like right down the line. You know, Lance Jones was a uh, a great addition for us. We got a really good bench. We got a deep bench. So, you know, like kudos to our players, man. It's a player's game. And those guys have been fabulous. And those players certainly cleaning up during awards. Zach is the player of the year. No surprise for the second consecutive year. And Braden's been terrific. And we could talk about those guys on the floor, but I want to talk about something that Zach did last week, basically sending a social media post saying, if Braden Smith's not on your first team All-America ballot, I don't want to be on that team as well. Yeah. As a coach, you have to absolutely love that when the biggest star yeah. in the game is trying to deflect credit and give it to other guys on his team. Yeah, very, very selfish. Just, you know, just a good guy. Um, but that's a that's a good street agent to have. Braden's got a good street agent in Zach Eady, <laughs> you know, going to bat for him and, and and fighting. But no, we got a lot of good dudes on our team. If you if you caught our senior night, you can kind of see um, how invested everybody is, um, especially our community and our fans to go along with our players. But our players have been great, and Braden and Zach obviously have led the charge for us. Listen, Matt, I know that you don't want the guys listening to people like me or the outside narrative about what this team is, what this team could be, but that narrative does seem to be that this team is built better for an NCAA run yeah. than previous teams. Why do you think that narrative could be true? Well, we shoot the ball better. You know, last year, like, you know, some of the, the ploys from other teams was just simply to leave people open and, you know, and just load up with Zach Eady. And, and this year we've made him pay. Um, we've been very consistent shooting the basketball when we take care of the basketball, you know, and have our turnovers around eight to 11, eight to 12, we've won those games. And so keeping our turnovers down, having that extra ball handler with Lance Jones really helps us. You know, our, our freshmen that have become sophomore are, are better defenders than they were last year, just having that experience. But I really think it comes to the, the space that we provide because we can shoot the basketball. They got to make a decision. Then they got to be able to live with that decision, depending on if they double Zach or they stay home and play one-on-one. -on -one. Matt, I'm not sure if you're even aware of this, but I can tell you that one of your assistants, Brandon Brantley, has been named the Howard Moore assistant coach <laughs> of the year inside the Big Ten, does so much work right. with Zach and the Bigs over the past decades. What makes him a special coach? Well, you know, he puts in time with guys. You know, he gives a lot of time to them. 
and uh, he's a truth teller. Um, he played 10 years overseas. He had three Big Ten championships as a player. Um, he really helps those guys um, from a big man standpoint, but also from a film standpoint. You know, he puts in a lot of time with all of them, but him and Zach got a special relationship, and he's just done wonders for Zach. Well, Matt, I want to ask who the assistant coach is on your staff that's dealing with the broadcasting arm, because I mentioned Rafael Davis. We got <laughs> another former Purdue guy, Robbie Hubble, yeah. with us all the time. Is there a broadcast boot camp that we're not aware of? You know, we're, we're just trying to get rid of Rafael's turtlenecks. You know, that, that, that's really been our ploy as a staff to get Rafael to understand that, you know, we, we need to get a tie, you know, collared shirt and uh, and get away from the turtlenecks. But no, he's been he's been fabulous. Oh. The thing that jumped out to me with him and Rob and um, just how good they were right away. You know, it, no matter what business you're in, it takes a while to learn your craft and to understand. And, and those guys have been great right away and great representatives of the Big Ten and great representatives of Purdue. All right, Matt, let's get, get you out of here on this. Uh, we just had the Oscars this past weekend. You won the Big Ten Coach of the Year on this award day. Do you ever look back to the 95 Oscars and feel like you were really robbed not winning anything for that cameo role in uh, Blue Chips in 94? <laughs> no, no. I was just happy to get a little bit of money and um, and, and play some pickup basketball because that's all it was. But no, that was – but it was a cool experience. It was a real cool experience. Well, listen, I think the actual day job has worked out pretty well. 2024 <laughs> Big Ten Co-Coach of the Year, his fifth Coach of the Year award, Matt Painter. Matt, we appreciate the time. As always, congrats, and we look forward to seeing you this week in Minneapolis. All right. Thanks, Rick. Uh, is there a more enjoyable guy to talk to? Paint is just absolutely terrific. Some other individual men's basketball awards. Ace Baldwin Jr. of Penn State named your defensive player of the year. Mason Gillis, the sixth man of the year. Mackenzie Mbako and Owen Freshman share the co-freshman of the year award. Owen Freeman, my apologies. Freeman also named the freshman of the year exclusively by the media. Rick Pizzo back with Trent Meacham. Thoughts on some of these other awards. The freshman of the year is always tough. I think Owen Freeman had a fantastic start to the year. Mackenzie and Baco obviously came on late for the Hoosiers. This year's maybe been tougher than ever for freshman scenes, especially in the Big Ten. So many fifth-year players dealing with transfers, playing against older and experienced guys. But Owen Freeman was not a, a national recruit by any means, but was consistently very, very good. I love the, his skill, skill and feel for the game combined with a competitiveness, a motor, I think he could be an All-American before his time's done. And McKenzie Mbako came in with the, the big name, was a little bit slower getting going, but he's been consistent in Big, big Ten play, almost 40% from three in conference play. Cam Christie, John Blackwell, Deshaun Harris-Smith also on that team. Christie is a guy that Ben Johnson has to hope to keep in the fold because the Gophers, if they get everybody back, they could be really good, but he's obviously a guy with some NBA potential. And now to the All-Big Ten defensive team, Ace Baldwin Jr., the Defensive Player of the Year. Cliff Amore, of course, who's the, one of the best shot blockers in the game. Zach Eady, Chucky Hepburn, Khalil Ware, and Brooks Barnheiser of Northwestern as selected by the Big Ten coaches. Baldwin is the Defensive Player of the Year. Is that what you expected? I did. You know, you have some, a trio of big men there that impact the game in the paint, def deflecting shots on the, on the glass. But from the point of attack... Ace Baldwin can completely eliminate your opposing point cards. But the defensive player of the year last year in the A-10 now comes to the Big Ten, does the, ten, the same thing. Look, Rick, he had four-plus steals in ten games this year. That's really hard to do. Had eight steals against Northwestern. So his positioning, his intelligence as a player on both sides of the ball, but defensively in those quick hands, man, he is an absolute – I would have hated to play against him. He is a guy that if you have the ball in your hands and he's not directly in front of you, you better have your rear view mirrors on because he's better than anybody I've ever seen it coming in from behind and forcing that steal. Big reason why Mike Rhodes and Penn State had a lot more success in year one of Rhodes being in State College than most people expected that they would have. And, of course, you can go ahead and you can see all these awards on BigTen.org. The third team, Peyton Sanford, Ace Baldwin Jr., Voted by both the coaches and media, Dawson Garcia, Ware, Barnheiser, Rink Mast, who Fred Hoiberg talked about earlier in the show, all third team coaches selections, Casey Tomanaga, Coleman Hawkins, and Bruce Thornton. Media selections on the third team. Go to BigTen.org. It's not just your complete list of winners, but also the Big Ten Sportsmanship Award winners can be found there as well. 
This is the bracket for the 2024 TIAA Big Ten Men's Basketball Tournament. Action tips off on Wednesday. Rutgers and Maryland, the early game. Michigan and Penn State will match up later that evening in the 11-14 game. Minnesota and Michigan State, the first of four second round games on Thursday. Ohio State and Iowa, we also know that game will be played on Thursday. Wisconsin, Indiana awaiting Wednesday's winners. Of course, you can see all of Thursday's and Friday's action right here on the Big Ten Network in the Fox Sports app. Rick Pizzo back with Trent Meacham. As we look ahead to the games that are set, let's do this chronologically. As we start with Rutgers and Maryland, two teams that never really found their stride this year, trying to make a run in Minneapolis. Yeah, and neither are heading in the right direction. Rutgers has lost six of seven, Maryland eight of ten. But I'll tell you what, Rick, it would not surprise me. Look, one of them is going to win this game. And this is defense versus defense. After they win this game, you got Wisconsin, then Northwestern. I would not be shocked if either one of them wins two or three games in this tournament. Wow. And that's, that's just the status of the Big Ten. These are two rugged teams. If they can make some shots, one of them is going to have a win and have some momentum going into the next round, and they're going to be a tough, tough out. Oh, there's no question. Rutgers can D you up, and Maryland can D up as well. I think the big question with Maryland, they did not have Julian Reese in that's that it. regular season finale. Without Julian Reese, they become a very different team on both ends of the floor. Meanwhile, bottom of the bracket, you have Michigan and Penn State on Wednesday night. Obviously, you look at the year that Michigan has had, and it's almost as if, and, and nobody believes this, the year needs to come to a close and there needs to be a reset. Whether it comes to a close on Wednesday night or not is to be determined. But Penn State is actually a team that there are many experts that believe they like the potential path for the Nittany Lions. I, I do. They won three of five, including they gave in, Indiana their last loss. They beat Illinois. You have Ace Baldwin a, as your leader. I, I like that matchup against uh, Doug McDaniel in this in this game. But then going against Indiana, they already beat them twice. Then going to Nebraska, just looking ahead for Penn State. They made the championship last year, and I, it would not shock me at all with how they play, the style play, the leader in Baldwin, Kern, and these guys on the on the wings that that can do their damage. So. Penn State, they're going to be a tough out. Uh, of course, they got to get past Michigan. It's a fresh season for everybody, but I do like that path for them moving forward. Yeah, it's not just about how you're playing at the time that the postseason arrives. Matchups, coaches will tell you sure. all the time, it's about who you are playing. How do you match up against those teams? We've seen year after year teams playing early in the Big Ten that make it to the weekend because the matchups are favorable on their end. As we take you now to Thursday, we know the 8-9 game is Michigan State, Minnesota. Gophers will have the home crowd on their side. And for Michigan State, you're a team with these late season struggles where you are now in danger, not of falling out of the NCAA tournament, but maybe being considered for one of those first four games if you lose early in Minneapolis. This is a massive game to start the day, and Minnesota's going to be at home. Michigan State is reeling. They're trending in the wrong direction. These two teams have played twice already. They split those games. The most recent matchup, because, Rick, I, with Michigan State, Hall and Hogard, they combined for 10 points. I think those guys are the key for Michigan State. they got to get them going. And also, they struggled when you think of interior defense against Indiana, their most recent game. Now they got to deal with Pharrell Payne and Dawson Garcia. Michigan State's going to have their hands full, and Minnesota playing at home. The crowd's going to be behind them. We'll see if they can do some damage in this tournament. Yeah, Dawson Garcia coming off that 30-piece last time yep. out. That's the first game of our 2024 tournament coverage. Comes away noon Eastern, 11 local time from the Target Center on Thursday. Ohio State-Iowa is the first game in the second session, so that's Thursday night in Minneapolis. And this is an NCAA tournament elimination game. Buckeyes have put themselves back into that conversation. Iowa likely needs to win a couple. The loser of this game is out of NCAA tournament consideration. The winner may have to win a couple of more, but you can't win more if you don't win the first one. Yeah, and look, both these teams are playing well. Ohio State has won five or six. Iowa won four or six. Both have been very balanced offensively. Iowa, the, I would give the, them the upper hand with their firepower on the offense, but Ohio State has also got it done on the defensive end. So this, Rick, I, I, I'm circling this matchup because one of these teams is going to get a big win and they're going to have some momentum. They've seen the ball go through the hoop. I think that gives you an advantage on day two in the tournament for them. Then they're going to Illinois against Illinois, a great opportunity for a big win. So 
One of these teams could be feeling great about their NCAA tournament chances. It starts in this key matchup. Again, two teams that are playing well, the opportunity to play against a, a top 10 type team in Illinois, and then advancing on. That bottom half of the bracket, I, I think is just wide open. I talked about what Penn State could do. Obviously, Indiana playing well, but Ohio State and Iowa, that's going to be a fabulous matchup of two teams that are playing really well. Yeah, I think it's really important that you point out the winner of that game does get a quad one opportunity against Illinois on a neutral court on Friday. You remember what this week was like for you, the three days as a player leading up to knowing that you're headed into the Big Ten postseason, whether you were or were not going to be an NCAA tournament team? I, I've been a higher seed. I've been a lower seed. And when, when I was a lower seed, we made a run. We won three games, made it all, all the way to the championship. So it, this is a fresh start to the season. And no matter what you've done before, good or bad, here it's March, single elimination. The tournament atmosphere is always one of the best, it, just one of the most fun environments to play in. So all these teams got a chance. And I think there's a number of teams that could surprise, surprise a, a lot of people. Predictions courtesy of Trent Meacham. Let's start with the early portion of the bracket. And as you take a look at the bracket as it stands right now, which four teams do you expect to advance to Friday to play those teams that have earned double buys? Uh, we're going to see Minnesota going up against Purdue. I believe that. The home crowd, that's going to be a fabulous game there, too. I think Wisconsin's going to beat the winner of Rutgers, Maryland. And I got Iowa beating Ohio State, facing off Illinois once again. As much as I want to say Penn State's going to do some damage, Indiana's playing so well. So I think Indiana and Nebraska are going to match up there Friday night. All right, so that takes us through the Friday quarterfinal matchups. And once you get to semifinal Saturday and the weekend, anything could happen. Should we expect a one versus two championship matchup between the Boilers and Illini, or does someone outside the top two play for the chip on Sunday? As I look at the bracket, I don't know if I see Purdue losing to these teams up in the top of the bracket, but look, I'm going to go with Wisconsin. I just think they play Purdue well on Sunday. Wow. I like their matchups. I like their balance as a team. I think they're just playing for something. They haven't won a Big Ten title, you know, in a couple years now. I think they're going to get there against Illinois. So you're not a believer in the late season momentum because Wisconsin does not have a ton right now. They, they don't, but I, I think they're going to get it together. With their depth and experience, I think they're going to make a nice run in the Big Ten tournament. All right, so Trent has Wisconsin and Illinois in Sunday's tournament championship final inside the Target Center. At the end of the day, who's hoisting the trophy? I think it'll be Illinois. I think they're the second best team in this league. They, they have a, a chip on their shoulder right now. They have yet, you know, if there's any blemish, they have yet to have a big win. And I think that could happen here in the Big Ten tournament. Uh, string together some wins, get to the championship, hoist a banner for the Illini. I think they're going to do it. Now, I will say, it would not shock me if either Indiana or Nebraska, I think that lower part of the bracket is wide open, but right now i got the Illini winning The it. city borders of Champaign will <laughs> remain open for Trent as he heads home following <laughs> this you, edition of Big Ten Today. Congrats once again to all of Tuesday's award winners. For Trent, I'm Rick. Thanks for hanging with us today on Big Ten Today. Tournament week has almost arrived.